This is the Celtic Exchange Weekly, this is Tino and this week I'm joined by James and Paddy as we cover all things Celtic. Celtic are now so efficient under Ange Postacoglu that they're now putting games to bed after just 27 minutes as witnessed in the demolition of Kilmarnock at Rugby Park. A result that means we're now just two wins from retaining the Scottish Premiership title. Before we get properly started for today, I recorded the pre-match with James here on Friday ahead of the game and here's what he had to say when I asked him for his pre-match predictions. Uh, I think it's going to be 4-1, no clean sheet. Um, Kelly have had some success, obviously. Their home form strong. Success at home, I mean. Um, Kyogo, Kyogo will get his brace, Kush, you're right. He'll take us on to 100 and he'll take himself on to 30. Key man for myself, Matt O'Reilly. I thought, he, you know, he, it's become a bit fashionable to not like O'Reilly's form, but if you actually look at how he played and how he contributed on Saturday there, he was involved in the goals. He was, you know, very active in the press and he's not got as much of his flair stuff this season as he, as he had last season. So, chance for him to shine on, on Sunday here. James, scarily accurate. Uh, so, the big question is, why have you waited so long, almost to the end of the season, to call one correctly? I mean, predicting anything Ange does and that the Celtic team does is, is pretty difficult. So, to get one right, I'll be pretty happy with that. Yeah, I mean... Um, in 27 minutes, I thought, well, I've got that completely wrong. It's going to be a, a 10 that we've been waiting on, you know. Um, and then I thought I thought O'Reilly was, was great throughout. And I think he's been good whilst not showing his heights in the last few weeks. So delighted for him. Yeah. I don't know if you caught his interview post-match. He just seems in a pretty decent place, actually. He's, he's slowly but surely getting back to that form. And there's just no doubt, Paddy, assists and goals are, are what really bring you back on, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's the game time as well, Tino. I think uh, he'll see this window of opportunity. Um, obviously, I think the poor performance um, in the first half from Moy last week, um, the absence of Hitati just now is, is probably giving him a bit of time to think, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm still... I'm still capable to mix it up here and still capable to, to push on as a footballer. Um, I actually thought last Saturday he was one of our best players and I criticised him quite a bit for the tackle that led to the, the free kick for Rangers last week. But actually when you look at it, it's, it's pretty poor from Carter Vickers. It yeah, leads him to, having, to them and uh, Johnson. Uh, yeah. to, uh, and Johnson, I agree with you there, that leads him in having to really kind of stretch for the tackle. Um, overall, I thought he was, he was very solid last week. He, he gives you this thing he's like um his legs seem to extend when it comes to like just nicking the ball off people I, like it, it must be very frustrating to play against because a lot of players think that they've got past him and he just nicks it at the last minute and it's his determination I just think that's uh is really starting to shine through and, and no better time in the season to be honest um a good a good run in for him gives Ange more headaches as well, especially when it comes to the summer, especially when it comes to looking at players leaving and players coming in over the summer as well. Yeah, he seems to quite enjoy the responsibility, James. Obviously, he played a huge role in covering Callum McGregor's in injury uh, by stepping back into the number six role and he, he thrived in that position. And I think, as you've mentioned, Paddy, with Hatati being out, there is an onus in the guys that know what it's all about at this moment in time to step up and hopefully we're going to see the best of him over the next... Eight games, six games, semi-final, final. Um, James, your Celtic moment of the week as well, please. Uh, probably I'd stick with Riley for it. Um, he saw after his goal against St Mirren, uh, I think it was the cup game, the 5-1, it was sheer relief. This is more, you know, joy that he's getting back to to where he was. Um, I, I think he's he's got you know, all the talent in the world. Joe Hart, you guys picked up in the post-match. Joe Hart was talking about the, the attitude and the atmosphere at, at Lennox Town. Everyone's here to learn and it's not like some of these guys are your learners. Everyone. And I think O'Reilly's top of the tree there. I think he really wants to improve his game. And I think that that's that's why I'd pick him as moment because he's he's not let it affect him. He's just kept coming back and kept coming back, determined to to prove he can do it. Yeah, credit to him. Paddy, as I was saying, why wait 90 minutes to win a game of football when you can do so in just 27? What did you make in general of the win at Rugby Park and what's your own Celtic moment of the week? Yeah, I, I think when we, obviously, we ran into that lead and even with a missed penalty, I, I, I thought we could have maybe have seen a Dundee United scoreline again, um, possibly even one more. I think a lot of the fans were thinking we could be getting uh, our, our 10 goals finally under this, uh, under this manager. I think we're going to see it. I really do. Um, for me, it was uh, it was keep them coming because obviously I've given the the prediction of 120 goals scored this season in the league, so it's it's obviously a great help on that one too. Um, they were relentless, just um, just basically from the get go, and 
as much as people uh, at Sky will like to say that it was a poor Kilmarnock performance, there's only one thing that can make people play that way and it's utter fear of who they're up against. And that, that Celtic performance yesterday just epitomised no matter who's coming in and out the side now, it's still a strong 11. It doesn't matter how strong it is. It's going to be enough to make people wary and keep people on their toes, but also press them into mistakes. And that's what we've done yesterday. Yeah, myself and Muff uh, done the post-match and we were talking about the fact that Sky seemed to constantly look for the, the negative in a, in a Celtic appearance. And what I mean by that is rather than saying, look how sharp Kyogo is, look how lively Matt O'Reilly's looking, they're highlighting on just how poor are this Kamarnock side at this moment in time. And it's like, I get that, that's part of it. But let's try and sell the game and look at the positive side of it and just be a bit more upbeat. That said, I do think your man Fraser Murray had a couple of quid on 10 goals or something yesterday. <laughs> Aye. He had an absolute shocker, which He's, can happen. You know, we, we spoke about the fact that it happened to Moy last week, but yeah. it was not his day, was it? No, no. And that's football, isn't it? You just... Um, I think he's what 19 no no, no he's 23 23 still, oh, still, he's still young st- uh, still young in the game and I think you know everyone's going to have those kind of performances um, but it's one he'll, he'll just want to forget um, you need a good manager to try and guide you through something like that and albeit he was probably happy to see the back of the game I still think sometimes getting hooked so early in the game is is not good for anyone not Generally, good for anyone but I think first and foremost McInnes was thinking I need to protect my job here. True. But also, I think taking the boy to the firing was part of it as well because there could, could be more and you could actually send them further down. It's a gamble kind of thing, but yeah. I, I think it was it was the right thing on balance to, to remove all it, this. It, it, it's harsh and it's extremely ruthless, but sometimes it's necessary. You don't see it a lot in football for a good reason, but I think you had to change something. Um, aside from that, just before we move on with the show in general, I would want to come to you, Paddy. You attend more away games than, than we do. And obviously there was the glaring omission of fans in general from, from what was a more than half empty rugby park, to be honest with you. What's your general take on that? I understand Kelly and St Mirren and various other clubs going to their fans and saying, what do you want us to do? And you can do that if you want, that's your choice, but don't then moan about standards in the game and Celtic and Rangers have got far bigger budgets when you're leaving, I don't know, 200 grand on the table yesterday or Sunday um, and 200 grand every other time a Celtic or a Rangers come calling what's your general take on that? It's a, it's a good question um, I think it seems to have got reined in even more and the ticket prices are creeping up as well to be honest even more I think you know it's very rare you see a ticket under £30 now for an away game um, you take that into consideration with your bus your minimum 15 sometimes for a bus now as well and then you know obviously People are out for the day. A lot of money goes into it, and I, you know, I take my hat off to the, those that do it religiously, week in, week out. It's a lot of money, and I tell you what, it it's a, an argument you hear a lot from away supporters about. You know, Celtic and Rangers are are in their own their own league. They're on they're like miles away from us. Yeah, you should be capitalising on every opportunity to make money. As a supporter, as a proper football supporter, I, I can understand the frustration though when a team is taking three stands and you've only got one in your home stadium. I understand that side of it. I do get it. Um, it's a it's a difficult one. It's a really difficult one. It is, but just suck it up for a couple of games against Celtic because it's just worth so much money. Football is a business. You can dress up whatever way you want and there's obviously the emotive side of, of football and sport in general, but as a business and that is a lot of money to leave on the table and there's shareholders as well who, I don't know how they feel about that. That's not where they're going to win their league or league position, uh, beating Celtic or Rangers at home. You know, their, their points are gained by the teams around them. So even from a sporting perspective, they're losing, they're not gaining enough for what they're losing. If they take, you know, it sounds a bit kind of capitalist or unlikely, but if you take the money, you can put it back into the squad. But they also don't do the basics as well in terms of the things that Bodo do and all these things. So there's there's a wider debate at play for that. But even if you look at it, it's a small town, Kilmarnock. Could the pubs be doing with that money? Absolutely. So all these these things that there's plenty of money sitting on the table and they're, they're not taking it and then they want to have a moan about it. Take your pick. Yeah. Paddy, I can absolutely under, understand your concerns as an away supporter for you know ticket price, 30 odd quid, travel, petrol, whatever that comes to. What I can't sympathise with is a dozen pints that you know lads are buying. That is, that's not Kilmarnock's fault. It's very difficult though, mate. It's tricky though. <laughs> <laughs> that it's budget. a tough situation. Cut back. Sure uh, is. Cut back. It's only three pints yeah. now. Okay, let's take a look at what's coming up on this week's show. We'll get started with the big topic and we'll be looking at how some of our recent signings are settling in and of how the Celtic squad is shaping up in general for the challenges that next season will bring, particularly in Europe. 
We'll then move on to this week's mystery sale where the lads will be tasked once again with naming the mystery former player. And after that is this week's listener's question where we'll look at Celtic's transfer policy when it comes to some of the high profile exits in recent years. And finally, we'll close out this week's show by bringing you something which we think you'll enjoy from this week in Celtic media. OK, so let's get the ball rolling with this week's big topic. The inclusion of Yuki Kobayashi, Tomoki Iwata and Seat Aksabanovic against Kilmarnock was the first time we've seen all three players start together in a Celtic shirt. All three only arrived at Celtic this season, so Aksabanovic in the summer and Kobayashi and Iwata in January. But this week's question is, do you think Anjan tends to give these players a more prominent role in the side moving forward, particularly with regard to Europe next season? And separately, where do we think the gaps still are, if any, if Celtic are to have a serious go at competing in the group stages of next season's Champions League? Paddy, your initial response to that one? Yeah, I think the three mentioned um, are, are definitely not going the door. Definitely not going the door. And the reason I say that is we, we look at the results um, of our, our group stage and albeit I think we, we forget that we, we lost our, our centre-half pair and a very settled centre-half pair and and Carter Vickers and, and Starfelt for the majority of the of the, the group stage games. They, we were, we were, they didn't start one game together. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were, so we were dealing with, obviously, uh, Maurice Jens and, and Stephen Welsh, who I think were kind of making up for each other's mistakes, to be honest, a lot of the time. Um, maybe not so much Jens, I actually think it was maybe just a bit too much for, for Stephen Welsh. Um, but f- for me, this is, this is a, a big push for us. And... I think if we were to have continued in Europe um, after Christmas, we would have seen it continue. I think what Ange really, really wants, I, I've said this before on the show, I don't think he, he's huge on just that set standard, uh, start to living. I think he's massive about rotation. And I think he knows how long the season is, how he can get so much out of his players and get them all on their toes just so that they, they, they're knocking the door, not just to start the league games, but they, they, they definitely get that chance in the Champions League as well. Um, this is a big, big year coming up for us to, to try and make a mark in it. We, it we're, it, we're pretty much there. It's looking very likely that we're going to be playing group stage football again. And I think those players now must be thinking, right, this is it. This is the, the chance to shine. And the likes of Haksabanovic, Kobayashi and uh, Iwata. Just, uh, Iwata, this is this is where they show why they've been brought to Celtic. Um, because unfortunately for them, things have been fairly settled after Christmas because we can keep the same 11, we can keep the players fresh. We've not had two games a week. That's a big factor. Yeah. James, unlike um, when Maeda, Hitati and O'Reilly came in, these other three lads, so Kobayashi, Iwata and Haksabanovic, and just taking a lot more time to bed them in gradually. Obviously, Haksabanovic is in the summer, so he's had more game time than the other two. But generally speaking, he's been pretty patient with all three, hasn't he? Yeah, I was thinking about them myself. You know, they're talking about these players now starting to make their mark, but it was, you know, three months prior last year when Maeda and Co, you know, started really hitting their heights. And we've, we've had that luxury. I think a lot comes down to what Paddy's saying about the the one game a week. But, I mean, you saw on, on Sunday there, you've what Angie's looking for is what seems to be to us a luxury of Abada, uh, Carter Vickers, Jota and Hatati, Hatati all out the pitch, all, all out the squad and your four goals up within 27 minutes. And wants them on the bench, obviously, not not out of the squad. Yeah. But then being be able to bring them on or rest them as, as the case may be. And, and we're getting there. I thought the, um, the I'm going to say three, but two of the lads, I thought Iwata and Kobayashi were excellent. I love Haksabanovic. I think it was his day. Um, even though he was involved in at least one of the goals, and maybe just the pitch didn't suit whatever. But a big thing for me is Kobayashi's comfort on the left. You, you see it. And, you know, to be fair to Starfield, he's got the comfort on the right. You know, he's been judged as a left-sided centre-half, but he's, he's right-footed. Mm-hmm. And then Iwata, phew, wow, he's just going to be something else, man. I think so as well. What we'll do, we'll take a brief look at each of the three, just on a wee bit more detail, and then we'll move on to the kind of more general question about the, the squad for, for next season. Kobayashi, so 22 years of age, plenty of time to develop. He's only had four appearances for Celtic in total, three starts and one substitute appearances. Uh, appearance we've only conceded one goal when he's been in the park uh, and it was that one against Kelly on Sunday and he was absolutely furious did you see him yeah. banging the surface and all that stuff and that's going to hurt on the, the park blast the surface um, <laughs> he'll learn that quickly enough but your general thoughts Paddy on, on Kobayashi from the relatively um, 
small bits of time we've seen of him. Yeah, I think I agree with what James is saying. Just that natural left-sided centre half, which we've been crying out for. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to go on and say the same thing, but Ange was very, very, um, very nice. We're basically praising him um, and saying there's a lot more to come from him. And, and, and he's very happy that we've now kind of answered that issue of having a left-hand, a left-sided centre half. Massive credit to Carol Starfelt for, for being in that position and, and putting himself out of his natural comfort zone and, and playing the, the way he has played uh, since he's come in the door. And I think that when we look at kind of what I mentioned in this rotational side, injuries are going to happen. We're going to play a lot more games, which is natural. You want these guys on their toes all the time. And Kobe Ashley is someone that's been sitting since January and biding his time. And it just, it looks as if he's been playing for his, like week in, week out for a few seasons now. He looks so comfortable just slotting in yesterday. Yeah. His distribution is very tidy, James, isn't yeah. it? It's just nice and clean and crisp. And as Paddy absolutely says, listen, Carter Vickers is going nowhere. You know, as long as he's at Celtic, he plays, you know, in the big games and otherwise. So he he is the starter at the back. Uh, and it's a, it's a battle for that position. And I suppose just having that, that natural left-sidedness, it does, you know, maybe Andrew sit tight with Starfield for this season. But moving forward, the start of next season is going to be real interesting as to who he gives an odd there, isn't it? I don't think so. I think it's quite straightforward. Um, if you think about how Ange plays football, one of the big things we're, we're getting from Kobayashi is tailors away quicker. So your counter-attacks are quicker. So you're, you're up the pitch in, in seconds. And Starfield's not slow, but he's got to get on his better foot or take a risky pass. That, that's that gone out of the equation so I think it's a Kobayashi Carter Vickers is going to be my, my back centre halves and it'll be Starfield and Welsh pushing to get their place but with the, the games with the rotation I mean I was more than happy to see Starfield there in, on his right hand side position there so you might see 60-40 in favour in favour of Carter Vickers next season and Starfield picking up the rest What's also interesting are around about six or seven weeks we've done an episode all about Starfield and you know would this be the time for uh, Kobayashi to, to take his position and so far that's not happened a lot of f fans Celtic fans and listeners might be tuning in thinking ah, Starfield's done nothing wrong and you know why these guys try to get him out that's not the case but I think in general when we're having these conversations you've got to look at Starfield's been phenomenal for Celtic and so far so good but you've got to look at what's next it's, it's, it's not good enough just to dominate domestically and, and do what they're doing phenomenal as it is and, and it looks like we're going to shatter all sorts of records but you better leave Ange's looking at what's next and what's around the corner, particularly with an eye on Europe. And Ange and his coaching staff will have to have tough conversations with players. So I think it's only right and fair that, you know, doing what we do, we have these debates and, and look at what the best possible options would be. I'd still say it's Starfield's chairs that you lose, lads. I really would. I think that um, it would take... I know, I know Ange has definitely got it in him with his team selection. He would be more than happy just to... to it, it's not about the individual is about the team. I know that's a big factor in how he he manages, but I think he's very, very loyal to Carl Starfelt. And I think that, you know, we've spoke about it there. Yeah, it's that next level up. I don't think Starfelt's had much time to really prove himself at that level. Um, I don't, obviously, with the group stages last season, did he, he made one one appearance? I think it was just one. Yeah, uh, I, just, I just think it's, it's Starfelt's chairs that he lose, and I still think that that will be, in my opinion, your two going in the only thing I think potentially changes that is Carter Vickers leaving Oh, I know I know. I want to be positive this show and it's a positive time but we, we do need to be serious with stuff like that as well I, I think that's interesting because we haven't really seen what Starfield can really do in a comfy position so he was comfy there on, on yeah, Sunday yeah. of course so if Carter Vickers was to go you let Starfield play to his strengths you know for, for me if he has to continue, he's, he's continuing on, on the right. And I want him to continue, absolutely. As you've said, you know, he's, he's been outstanding. I don't think it's his years because if you go to the top five, ten teams in Europe and that's where we aspire to be, you know, playing against these guys in Europe, it's certainly half they've got a left-footed guy and a right-footed guy to give them that comfort. And if we want to be in amongst them, we need to be like them. Yeah. Paddy try gets cancelled we talk a CCV making no, the movie. I'm, so I'm a realist. But you're right. <laughs> I mean, I would on my wee my wee monologue there about how you know we're right to debate these things and you're absolutely right there's going to be teams in for CCV in the summer it's whether he sees his future at 
Celtic for another year or two beyond that but at some point we'll have to cross that, that bridge and look at that reality um, Starfield was generally comfortable but he did get Meg a cracker in the first five minutes Aye, over on the left hand side <laughs> aye, aye, coming in to cover uh-huh. aye, so aye. more evidence a Meg's a Meg James more evidence anyway um, moving on from that one so Tomoki Iwata I, I think we cover Iwata almost every show now whether it's the pre and post match stuff and, and the weekly so I think we're in agreement here we're all huge fans and I think the, the fan base in general are really excited about what he'll bring He's only had 10 appearances in total and only two of them have been starts now. So Sunday and the Ross County game prior, eight substitute appearances. Matt O'Reilly, again, I mentioned his post-match interview. He described him on Sunday as a tank. Says he's always working on his upper body and, and strength in the gym. Um, but as we've seen, he's also very sharp. He covers the ground. It's not like he's a cumbersome kind of you know heavy player. So the question is, uh, will he cement his place in our midfield three, James, by the end of the season? And I suppose more generally, do you feel he's Champions League quality? Uh, yes and yes. I, th- I think it's from now till the till the run in. Um, it's going to be more rotation. It's you know, Paddy. You're touching on Ange not having this this set eleven. I don't think he's got a set midfield three as well in terms of where you are. You're, you know, if say picks Atati, McGregor, and Nawata, that's fine. Atati's probably the only one that's cemented as an advanced McGregor, Nawata, and I mean throughout the game, we'll switch, we'll rotate that. It might be double six parts, maybe double eight parts. There's real flexibility because of the talent of the two of them, McGregor and Iwata. And then you've got, you know, more talent on the on the sidelines in O'Reilly and Moy, Turnbull, you know, others kind of thing. So I think it's a really interesting time for us in terms of the midfield. I think the versatility that Awata clearly offers is is going to be so important, particularly at Champions League level, Paddy, because so Andrew was saying post match, you know, don't be confused, this guy's not just a holding midfielder, he's got more strings to his bow. And I think if him and McGregor shape up in the double six, so two holding midfielders with, say, Hatati more advanced, that's fine and that maybe allows you to get a foothold in the game. But if at different points you need to go and express yourself and switch that so either Iwata just sits on his own or, or McGregor and you you know, switch the triangle up a wee bit, then you can go and express yourself. And Ange has spoken before about the players having autonomy to do that. Having Iwata and McGregor gives you that option. 100%. I think, uh, I think back to both games against Shakhtar um, and the gap like the, just that missing gap for that one player maybe just tucking in again um, especially the game at Celtic Park when Mudrik scored an absolute brilliant goal I, I, a lot of people say Juranovic should have kind of got there but I can see what Juranovic was possibly trying to do as well and watching him maybe cutting in or play the ball in that's by the by the fact is is that the run was so easy from his own half and that extra midfielder would have would have kind of Brought that brought that pressure onto him. Um, not taking anything away from Madrid, a, a tremendous goal, but that's a big thing for me. It's having that transition. It's having those two players that, if they are going to partner up against harder teams and Shakhtar, like a lot of people say, we should have beat them. They're a, they're a better team than us. They, they, did any million pound player? They, they're, they're a better team than us <laughs> on, pa- on paper. They, they just hadn't played football in a while, yeah. can, which was very evident. But the thing is, is that what. We're going to come up against. We're going to come up against teams that will run away with it against us. We're better players naturally. I'm hoping next year's draw we get, we get something that we can actually say we'll take six points because it seems that a lot of other teams in the Champions League seem to get that. You see some of the runs that teams have went on, or, or even just managed to get themselves into third place and go into the Europa League. That's a brilliant season for me on that one. But I think that these are the kind of games where. Just like you guys are saying, we didn't have that luxury last year. It was it was McGregor holding back. And even then, McGregor would want to still come up and try and put his bit into it as well. I just think with someone like Abata and McGregor both playing together, allowing just a tatty to do all that running in front of them, that's, that's very exciting for me. I think that that is your, your three for next year. Um, and yeah, it will vary how they all, all line up together. And, and they might not start, you know, one or two, they might not start the weekend. Yeah. And if you're playing, you know, Champions League, you might get O'Reilly and Moy coming in at the weekend. That's yeah. that's a difficult one, though, and, and I put that Moment, to you momentum. guys. Is like, I, I think Moy would be comfortable in that kind of position next season, but does, uh, does Matt O'Reilly sit in his hands for a year? I, I don't I don't know. I don't know what happens there. What you do see with Celtic's um, use of the five substitution rule is that Ange seems to, generally speaking, keep players happy. And this, this option, you know, this five sub option, 
allows you to do it, enables you to do it more more than ever. You know, because be, before you'd have to make the hard decision, three guys will get an odd, maybe a couple are enforced through injuries, and all of a sudden you've got very good players, international footballers, sitting on the bench not getting much game time. So I think Angie's got an knack for, you know, making sure everyone's kept happy yeah, as well. If, if, you, if you're Matt O'Reilly and you're playing almost week in, week out in the league and you're getting the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes in the Champions League, that's your window to be in the next game. So it's all on yourself. That's a good point. Everyone will get a chance to prove themselves, no doubt. The last wee thing about Iwata, myself and Miff, again covered it in the post-match, is his work rate and movement to make himself available for a pass for his for his teammates. And, and it's, you know, some guys might say, I'll just drop a couple of yards back here or move out to the side. He actively sprints to get in position. He, he'll go on a you know, five, seven yard burst to make an angle for his teammate. And I think he just... Uh, out with his obvious qualities I think he's just a really good teammate a really good guy to have around O'Reilly was speaking about the personality of him and Kobayashi he says they're great lads they've settled in really well so all very encouraging when it comes to Tomoko Iwata looking at Hag um, he's obviously been here a bit longer been here since the summer 23 years of age 34 appearances for the season so far but 11 of them are starts and 23 are subs should have checked but he's probably our most used sub you know but they're yeah, about my bad, that must be similar. Uh, he's got five goals and four assists in that time. Um, James, he's a complete maverick. He's the kind of player that every kind of fan wants to watch. But do you think he can have an impact at Champions League level? And also, do you think he's more impactful as a substitute or as a starter? I think following on from you know the conversation there, that you know he might be similar to to Riley in that regard. That you've got Jota, you know, playing ahead of you. We don't know what the right wing is going to look like. Obviously, but my is it you're obviously going to be. You know, Ange always puts my head in so if you've got those two guys starting I don't think most Celtic fans would change that so where does Haxmanovic fit for, from a starting living perspective for the Champions League I don't think he's there in terms of mentality yet I think he's got a wee bit of maturing to do just in terms of no, knowing when to make the run knowing when to go past the guy a few things I, I want to kind of take yesterday out it was, it was a poor display on a poor pitch so I, I don't really want to make any judgments Haxmanovic on that but I think he's just developing at Celtic and I think he's going to be phenomenal. I don't think he's quite there yet. I love him though. There's real scope to develop, Paddy. He's, he's 23, which isn't young, you know, but it's young enough to be, you know, making improvements in your game and Angie's the kind of guy that will absolutely, you know, chip in and, and help him do so. And he'll also get that bit fitter and sharper. He still seems that he's maybe just not quite firing all cylinders. So there's lots more to see from him. If he picks up that yard of pace, I think he's missing. Um, I'll happily go on record and say this I think if he's a good pre-season under his belt I think he'll be our left winger next year from Maeda? No, I do so can he be like Jota in terms of improve his defensive work as well then because that's that's essential it's massive that's why he's, there's probably 50-50 in terms of what Maeda does yeah, and is obviously his biggest time with his players is definitely on that training pitch and I think like, like it's, he's going to what Tino says he'll chip in with him this year I think there's definite talent there's a ruthlessness to him. Yeah. I think that if that if he gets to a fit level, that will start to shine. And um, I just think he's the type of player that will take on any defender, will find that yard of pace. I do think he's got a great range of passing on him. But I also think that you're mentioning about arrogance about maybe just on the football part. I think he's got an arrogance about himself. And it's fine-tuning that and making him... I think so, yeah. I do, I yeah. do. And it's not in a, a sense that... He's going about to think he's better than everyone. I think it's possibly over, over that he just needs he needs to know that he's better than everyone. Do you know that way? Just show it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and he needs to be pointed in the right di direction. He's got bags of ability, bags of ability. And I just think that it's uh, it's this summer that's a big, massive push for him. But I think he'll be more influential in Europe down the left than Maeda would be. And I could see Maeda being that that guy that comes on with 25, stretch, 30 stretch, minutes yeah. with legs to run, pace to burn for, for the last half hour. It's a really interesting take because I've heard um, Hacks Barnett speak a few times, Joe, uh, who's on the show at times, Joe went to interview him post-match one time. And for me, it came up, I think there's a real fine line between arrogance and just self-belief. And I think energy's more in the self-belief category for me. He's He didn't come across as cocky, arrogant. Maybe you might get from a Todd Cantwell, for example. That's right? not, that's dear, not dear, going dear, there. Dear, 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 dear. Uh, anyway, um, but I just think he believes in himself. He knows he's a good player and I don't think there's much wrong with that. And no. I also think that to make it the very top, you need to have that, at least that bit of arrogance. So I think there's always ways to channel it, Paddy. You're absolutely right. But I also think that you won't be allowed to get ahead of yourself in the Celtic dressing room. So if it was slipping into 
Ash, why man the bench again or anything like that or I'm too good for this. Ask Jackie Marcus. <laughs> He'd be off out the door kind of thing. So what? I, th- I think he's kind of skirts the arrogant self-belief thing quite well. I know, I, and I, I genuinely think you can definitely link the two. No problem. I, I, I know what you're saying with that. I think that for me, considering the injury he had at the beginning of the season, I think there's almost just that little bit in him that he thinks that if I, if I wasn't injured, I would be starting every week. And... If I'm fit enough, I will be the best left winger. We, we were saying it like early days of the season. This guy's going to be this guy's going to be brilliant. Some I heard some saying he, he'd be better than Jota. I don't know if he'll, he'll go that far. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I think he's got that. He's got the ability, I do, but, but I, I just think he needs a wee bit different. But it's, it's fine tuning that that mental side. Yeah. I think will be the difference. Maybe so. I hope Haxivanovic thinks he's the best left winger at yeah. the club, and I hope he goes on to fulfil that you know potential so we'll see how that all goes so out with the three guys there Hak Zibanovic Iwata and Kobayashi just want to look in general at areas for improvement moving forward just you know very briefly as we head into next season and obviously with a an eye towards the Champions League it's how you always seem to be looking at things James when we're talking about players and I think you're right to do so um, just briefly on goals do you think Joe Hart's good to go for at least another season and do you think he could at least benefit from having somebody to genuinely challenge him because he doesn't have that right now. He doesn't have anybody breathing down his neck. We've spoken about Seagrass just not working out. I think he's missed the last 17 squads now, somebody was saying. And there's been some injury there, but generally speaking, that's been a move that's not quite worked for whatever reason. So Joe Hart is absolutely assured of the number one spot, but you know in football, everybody raises their levels when they've got a challenge and Hart doesn't have that right now. I just don't see who we invest in though. That's the thing. If we go and try and bring someone in to challenge him, Celtic need to be really looking at the future. We've had failed attempts with goalkeepers lately and he's been a massive, massive help. And and to, to sign him for a million pounds has been incredible. Yeah. But we can't mess up on this, this position any longer. Um, not getting Forster at the end of that season was a, a big blow that to was Celtic. One, that was a one sure for was, yeah. Spending that amount of money on a guy that's still on our books is incredible as well. You're not entertaining his return, I'm are you? I'm not saying his name as well. <laughs> um, but the, the, the thing for me is that if you're going to try and bring a goalkeeper in to challenge him, he needs to be of the right age, he needs to be of the right ilk to play in that team and he's not going to sit on the bench. Mm. Sorry, I was just going to say, what encourages me is the fact that Celtic have got so many players in their squad right now and particularly in their first living that a year, two years ago, we didn't even know who they were. Do you know what I mean? And we've got, I'd say, reasonable knowledge of the game, but there's, I'm just, just plucking guys out of nowhere. You might be as well just looking for the best goalie in the J-League right now, because he'll probably be See, else I, sometime soon. I don't I, know the goalies under the best in the J-League. <laughs> so it's a wee bit of a filler. Um, but yeah, you know, there's every chance he could go to any corner of the globe and find someone, because you're right, Paddy, the guy moving forward beyond Joe Hart, who has been fantastic for Celtic, but the guy moving forward needs to have a certain skill set. He needs to have that quick distribution, come through the ball at his feet and all the other basics you'd expect of a good goalie. Yeah, I, I think it's the timing slightly off to seeing a guy today and play him in the Champions League in September would, would be hard. You know, It's a lot to get up to speed with you know, through close season. I think the guy we sign in the summer will come in and, and challenge her. I think we will sign a keeper in the summer, by the way. I think they've been looking at that. Just even on Sunday's goal, you know, McGregor's fault and all that stuff. I think Boric, his peak kind of saves that kind of goal. I know it's very, very harsh and he's, he's done nothing wrong. Aye. He's not done anything exceptional as well. And for us to get through Champions League against top quality, it's got to be that that exceptional talent. So I think they'll have it on their board for, for, for guys to sign in the summer. I don't think that guy then comes in and starts playing Champions League. I think you he, he, he bed him into to the system and maybe by turn of the year, you know, he's up to speed and stuff. I love Joe Hart. It's been a phenomenal yeah. signing, but we've always got to be looking at improving in the future. Definitely. And I think it'd be a great uh, goalie to learn under. So if, if we bring in somebody stay. who's 22, 23, 24, who's you know, got the basics of ball at feet and all that kind of stuff, and then he works with Joe Hart on the various other as- aspects of goalkeeping, it's got to be a plus. You're paying big money for that though, Tino. That's the thing. Yeah, at, at, like for a goal. Him at 19 or something. Aye, yeah. Aye, you, but do you not, just to counter that, do you not think that every goalie nowadays is learning that? So, so, Keep in mind, so the pass back rule came in when Packy Bonner was getting to yeah, these two days and he that. said, I'm not be doing that, fellas. <laughs> really struggled. But the game has changed a lot since then and I would say only now has it come to the point where any and all new young goalkeepers coming through, that is their game. I, th- I think it's a big difference between knowing the pass back rule and being able to play as a backy. But, a- but what I'm saying is every goalkeeper now that's being coached must be getting coached with the ball at their feet. But they you, must be. But then you can see you could say the same for, for Joe Hart and albeit he's maybe kinda of picked that 
style up at a later point in his career. You look at obviously what happened with him at Man City, the trust that was kind of put on him over in, in Italy, the trust that was put in him over in uh, when he went back to West Ham and Spurs. It's it's easy easier said than done. It's a it's a mental side. It's a mental side playing under that pressure. And I have to say domestically, yeah, he he does it. He gets away with some things. He really does. But he's been found out in Europe. He has been found out in Europe. And I know that that's what Ange wants us to do. Absolutely, we'll never change that. So what do you do? You have to change a goalkeeper. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm not, I think Hart has got his issues with the ball at his feet. What I'm saying is almost every goalkeeper coming through in the game nowadays will have been, you know, ha had that put upon them. That, you're, that you're, is a you're saying there's a wide enough pool that it shouldn't be 40, 50 million to get one of those guys. I, I think if you're saying at 10 years of age, I'm a goalkeeper and you get signed up in academy and you get coached, one of the first things they'll be doing is saying, right, let's get you with the ball at your feet. And that'll be much more prevalent moving forward than young goalkeepers. So Joe Hart, he's had to try and adjust mid-season, sorry, mid-career, having had a very successful career, doing everything he knows well, you know, being a, a very good and accomplished goalkeeper. And then he goes and plays under somebody like Pep and he says, yeah, I know you're good at all of that. I need you to also do this. It's almost impossible. Old dog, new tricks and all that stuff. I just think that there will be goalies out there that we don't know of. Listen, Time will tell and all that stuff. We'll find out soon enough. But I think there'll be a few out there that we will be like, and they won't be the finished article, but they'll be far comfier with Joe Hart at his feet and we can see what we get from there. Uh, apparently Barkas, and, I, I, and I've not seen this myself, apparently Barkas is very good with his feet. Apparently. Is he any good with his hands? Nah, he's not good with his hands. He's not good with his positioning. <laughs> but that, I'll pop a dumb I think it is the mental side. That's the big factor for me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, moving on from that one, just, and as I say, we're not going to spend a lot of time in each area of the park, but defensively, um, it might have been off here before we started, James. Alistair Johnson, absolutely. Good to go. I think he's ready for that level of football. Carter Vickers, absolutely. We don't yet know about Kobe Ashe. Certainly a maybe. Starfelt, maybe the jury's out on, on Champions League, but as you say, Paddy, maybe One the shirt says. Uh, and then there's some others, you know, Taylor, is he a question yes, for that level? No. Taylor's got that level. For I think me. so, the Champions League. League. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Tony Ralston? Perfect to come off the bench yes. and then play from the start in the league at the weekend. Uh, I'm talking about starting in Champions League. No. Right? Uh, and the other one is Burnaby. We just don't know yet. Maybe, maybe not. So where do you see? What's your general summary of the, the defensive setup? I think we're, we're pretty strong in the starting positions. You know, you're, you guys obviously uh, debating on Taylor. But say, say if we take three out of the four, we're, we're, well, two out of the four are agreed. Kobe Ashe looks like he could be. Big athlete, comfy in the left. Um, I think there is a certain element of what Angie's always been trying to avoid is the gap between my starter and my sub. I think, you know, because we don't know Burnaby, we don't know what's going to happen, if he's going to actually cement his talent and, and show he can be left back. And I think on, on the right, I, I am comfy with, you know, um, Ralston on the bench at right back. I, th I think on, he's... On the bench, yes. Aye. But that, that's the big debate for me, is just what is, after the first 11, we need, we need to avoid that gap. So two out of four is solid and two potentially. Good maths. Um, I just think we need to look at starters, Champions League-wise, and I suppose we're on the same page with Taylor, Paddy. Do you think we need to look at left-back again? We've not quite... The Bernabe sign has not gone as well as we hoped. No, it, it hasn't. Um, I take nothing away from, from Greg Taylor um, and what he's what he's done, what he's, the game he's come on to. And um, I just I just think of some of the games in Europe, though, and I think uh, especially Bodo Glimt, uh, he looked lost against a, what should have been a basic fixture for us and I know that he's, he's got better since then absolutely but that is a, a level for me that yeah, we, we, we should have answered we should have someone in place and someone ready for that level does he get an opportunity for this group stage coming? 100% he does he does I just don't know if he's Champions League level and I think that's fair. I think guys like Starfield and like Taylor have probably earned that opportunity. Now, we know Ange doesn't do sentiment. You know, if you're not ready, you're not ready. But I think they've potentially earned the opportunity. And we'll, we'll see how they bed in. But Ange will be aggressive in the transfer market. And if he feels there's any sort of gap, he'll be going all out to, to fill it, whether it's at left back, goalkeeper, whatever else. I want to move quickly onto the midfield. From my point of view, I'm very confident in Callum McGregor, Rio Hotati, Tomoki, Tomoki Iwata, and probably Matt O'Reilly as well. But Moy and Turnbull would continue to be the concerns for me. Where are you on those six, James? Exact same as you. Yeah, the, the, the four are fine. O'Reilly's got a wee bit to go. Um, mm. and, and it's more in terms of 
get back to where he was. You know, if this was last year, he'd be going, definitely, that's, that's no problem. It's dipped a bit because he's disrupted his season. But yeah, Moy can definitely have some impact off the bench. Turnbull, probably the same. But you couldn't be starting them, I don't think. They would get run over the top of. Just too immobile for that level of football. Paddy? I think Turnbull will leave this summer. I think um, so. But I, 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 I kind of agree with, with the, the both of you on that as well. Um, I'd still, like... Uh, I've, I've said that this is a big season for Matt O'Reilly. I've said that since since last season. And I actually think, think it's been very, very stop-start from him. But his attitude towards the games lately is really, really impressing me. Really impressing me. I, I think just he really wants that jersey. He really wants to be representing this club. And he, he, he says it in every interview he does. And um, I think it's a big summer for a lot of players. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised that, albeit we've been very, very quick with our transfers at the beginning of each window, There'll be a few on the back burner. Let's see how this guy goes in pre-season. Let's see how the rest of the team all kind of mar up at the same level. If everyone's there, brilliant. If there's a few that are slacking, get these guys in. I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at it that way. Yeah, there's no doubt there's just going to be ongoing change. And the good thing is, from a player point of view, you're, you can never relax. Your place is never assured at this you know, at this club. And I think when you hear guys, like all of them actually, but when you hear guys like O'Reilly speaking, there's a real maturity that comes through in a lot of the players and... They accept that. They know the challenges of, of being at such a big club and I think most of them seem to be up for the challenge. So um, that in itself is a good thing. Moving on to the wingers. So Jota, Maeda, Haksibanovic, Abada. I think James Forrest has maybe finished at this level. That sounds really harsh to say right and, and I don't like saying it but that's how I feel about it. Um, but the four I've mentioned, there's talk just now, we'll get on a wee bit of exit talk and a wee bit but there's talk of Abada potentially moving on this summer. Uh, Ajax are the latest to be, to be linked. So if we take him out of the equation and just look at Jota, Maeda, Haksibanovic, good enough is, is the first question, but also while they'll be here, Jota might be somebody that's yeah, looking elsewhere. Yeah, come under pressure. Yeah, we will. I think so. I, I, and same bracket kind as, as CCB. Um, I think the two of them will be definitely getting looked at. The only thing that might be the saving grace is that they're one year into their, their deals. And mm. I think, you know, the value's at their highest at the moment. So... That that may be the thing that helps us, and 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 obviously Champions League. A lot, the, the, both of them will be like hundred percent. Another crack at a, that, a guaranteed crack at the Champions Aye. League. There's there's only so many clubs can offer it. I don't know what's the number party thirty two. How many's in that? I don't know. It's how many's in that thing? It, it's not changing this year. Is I think it? it's the no, year after year. Year. Swiss model. Um, but the bottom line is, there's only so many clubs can guarantee that. And Celtic, all going well, are going to be one of them. Um, I won't spend any time today on Rocco Vata and Ben Summers, but. Great to see another couple of young lads coming through and great to see them getting more game time yesterday. So a debut for Ben Summers and, and well done to him on that. We've now seen a wee bit more of Vata and he seems to be very much in Ange's plans. They're exciting, forward-thinking players. So great to have that coming through and, and long may that kind of stuff continue. Up top, well, I, I, I'm saying Kyogo's a definite yes. He's certainly a, a, a million percent yes domestically. He's fallen a wee bit short in the European stuff. And oh, just while we're on the subject has certainly got bags of potential, but we just don't know. And I think even if the two of them were a yes, I think we still need a third striker. We're still a, a wee bit light in that area. You need a number one striker for Champions League level. I'd, I'd put all my budget in the summer, by and large, into goalie and striker. I think you need someone who's going to be able to handle it at the, the top level. Um, and I think Kyogo will perform at that level, but not in the... Not, we're not going to be signing Haaland, but something... So, <laughs> someone <laughs> in that. <laughs> yeah, no. pa apparently Ronnie Dyla had him on his transfer list and Lowell said no. Yeah, three years back. Shocker. Um, but, you know, so, someone who's just in, in that company and can go and, you know... We need to catch that kind of person, obviously young, you know, in the, the, the Dyla mode of trick when he was like 17 or 18. Um, so, I, I, for me, we need a... a a guy who's going to go and mix in the Champions League, I don't think we can be 100% confident that Kyogo's going to do that for us. So Paddy, we're going to lose Carter Vickers, but we're getting Haaland in, so... <laughs> <laughs> but, but he's relax. playing in goal, so... All yeah. rosy. Um, <laughs> but do you think we are a wee bit light up top, Paddy, at the moment? Um, definitely think we need another striker. Uh, the striker number three or striker number one? I don't know. I actually think Kyogo, I said at the beginning of last season that yeah, after the Champions League campaign, we we need someone that's going to bury the chances, some of the chances that he had. The chances were there. Some of the chances that Maeda had as well. We need yeah. someone that's, that's going to stick them away. Um, having said that, he's he's been exceptional this season. He's been unbelievable this season. And I get it, it's domestically. Um, but to keep yourself motivated and still go and deliver domestically, 
my question with my uh, Maeda and Kyogo, for that matter, is it's the bottle playing at that high level. And, you know, you look at Kyogo's age, 27 going on 28. Why is this, like, and no offence to the J League, but why is this rise in Europe only happening now? Has is, is someone witnessed that, you know what, he can do it here, no problem, but he's not... He's not going to stick goals away in the Champions League. He's not going to do this in Europe. I, I don't. I don't know the answer to well, that. Why yeah. didn't Why didn't Brighton sign him? Instead, yeah, you know, yeah. Who, who's yes. the boy they signed? Is it Minamoto? Is it? I don't know his name. I think so. Yeah. Right. So, so they signed him, and they've known about Kyogo, but they went for him as did Ange, and it turns out the guy's absolutely dynamite. Yeah, but I suppose different players can hit their peak at different times as well. So True. I think Kyogo's been a success. You know. Um, to varying degrees throughout his career, and I also think he's he's a better player now than when he signed for Celtic. Yeah. I think he's 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 improved. He knows how to work the system. Hopefully, Celtic continue to find him more. With you know some of the the deliveries as well. Well, that's what I was going to say. You know, I think the players behind him have got better as mm-hmm. well, and and releasing them quicker. So they'll maybe create more opportunity. And yes, he, he fluffed his lines on a few occasions last season, but there's also a huge learning curve. You know, within those half dozen games in the Champions League, and I think he'll be better for it. So there's. I think there's definitely a third striker that should come in and at least to compete with Kyogo to be in that level. And who knows, you know, maybe they kind of swap shots at different times and somebody gets an odd and somebody backs them up. But I think there's definitely room for improvement in the, the striking area. Final question as we move on from, from this topic in general. Would you feel confident, generally speaking, each of you heading into next season's next season's campaign with the squad we have plus another couple of key additions? So you've mentioned goalie and striker, James. If we got that, would you be happy? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, where are you at, Paddy? I'd be happy with that, but I just think a massive thing for Celtic. It just depends on the draw. <laughs> it really does. And I know that's easy to say, but... Control the controllables, Paddy. Look at that group last year. That's a solid group yeah. we were in, so... It's tough, but that's that's that level. Yeah, that's what you've got to... to you know, deal with if and when you get there. So the plan at Celtic, just in general terms, it appears to be as good as it's ever been in recent years. And there's no doubt that Ange already has an eye on next season. So let's see what the summer brings. OK, let's move on to this week's Mystery Cell. And we'll start with a quick reminder of last week's Mystery Cell for anyone who missed it. Clue number one, I played for my country at Euro 96 and at World Cup 98. I've scored in a League Cup final win for Celtic and I signed for Celtic in September 97 before retiring from football in July 2000. The answer, of course, and I think it was yourself that got it, Paddy, was Mark Reaper. So his time at Celtic was sadly, you know, cut all too short due to injury. But your thoughts on his time in general at the club? I just remember, like, the significance of him that season. Um, obviously, stopping the 10 and and even just, like, the marker being laid down in that League Cup final. Um I remember just my, my, my brothers and my dad noticing a huge buzz about the aim. And obviously I, I can remember a lot of the football from back then, but the importance probably wasn't at the front of my thinking. But I could see the the, the delight in the aim and kind of thinking this this could be it. This could be it. We've got a, a team now that know how to win. Um, and Reaper was a big part of that. And I, I remember a lot of people, how gutted they were when, when they did have to retire. So yeah, yeah good player. Good player. Definitely. So just in terms of his general fact fail, signed for Bum Janssen in September 97. And as Paddy says, he was a key part of the team that stopped the 10, forming a solid partnership with Alan Stubbs at the time. Prior to Celtic, he played with West Ham and Bromby. And on the international stage, he represented Denmark at Euro 96 and France 98, where he also scored a goal in the group stages. And as mentioned, unfortunately, he had to retire early from the game, having picked up a toe injury, quite a bizarre or quite a unique injury, playing for Celtic in October 98. What does he do now, James? He runs a hotel. Oh, correct. You've been Wikipedia. <laughs> I don't know that. Did I know that? He now owns in, and runs a hotel. In, in, is, it, is it Arhus? Uh, it's Arhus, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the middle of your street. <laughs> no, uh, no extra points for that, though, James. That is How not part of the mystery cell. Uh, James, yourself, any further comments on Mark Reaper? Oh, I loved him. He um, was just a classy, classy player. Big, aggressive guy. I really liked the, the partnership he was forming with Stubbs or had formed with Stubbs. And you're thinking, right, there's a bit of a foundation we can, we can kick on for here. <laughs> Um, and so I, for him to, you know, to be out injured and then not getting back, obviously was, was pretty devastating. It was a real disappointment because you thought you'd something solid to, to build on there. Um, so hope his hotel's doing very well and he's a happy man. We all wish him all the best with his ongoing hotel ambitions. Hotel, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to this week's Mystery Cell. So as always, the first 10 listeners to reply with the right answer to the Mystery Cell on our Twitter page won 30 days free of the Celtic Exchange Plus. Just head to the Twitter page at Celtic Exchange right now for details on that. So thanks to for, for this week. They go to Paddy James on Twitter who sent this one in for us this week. Paddy's a big supporter of the show and he was keen that we 
tested your lads' knowledge on this week's Mystery Celt. So clue number one, Alex Ferguson signed me for Aberdeen, where I then won the league in the 84-85 season. John Hewitt. Clue number two, I played in the inaugural season of the English Premier League, but my team were relegated that season. Nothing from you, Paddy. It's not John Hewitt, by the way. No, nothing yet. And clue number three, I won the Scottish Cup with Celtic in 1995. I've stated the rules last week, but just to reiterate, you lads have got until I come back from reading out this next week's section to provide your answer. 1995. Pardon? The Cup in 1995. We didn't win it in 94. No, I didn't. I was changing it and say 85. Yep, Scottish Cup in 1995. So while the lads are having a wee think about the mystery cell, I want to give you a quick reminder of the additional content we provide to subscribers over on the Celtic Exchange Plus. We produce extra pre- and post-match podcasts for every Celtic game, and we'll be doing so once again ahead of the Motherwell visit on Saturday at Celtic Park. As always, we'll be putting our match preview podcast out on Friday afternoon, before then returning shortly after the final whistle with our full match reaction show. Separate from our match day content, we also have a range of additional episodes in including interviews with ex-players, coaches, journalists and Celtic authors to keep you entertained and up to speed on all things Celtic. If you haven't already subscribed, you can do so now at the CelticExchange.com slash sign up where it takes less than two minutes to get set up and to enjoy everything we have to offer our subscribers. Our all-in option comes in at just over £1 a week, so if you enjoy what we do and want to hear even more from us across the week, then visit the CelticExchange.com slash sign up now. What are you going for, Paddy? Nah. Nah, it's not. Nah. nah. Struggled. Wait, I guess it Derek White was too late. Yeah. Uh, Joe Miller's too late. So Paddy James on Twitter will be delighted. He wasn't sure if it was too easy. I thought it was a, a decent level here. Um I'll tell you lads after the show, but it's a it's a good one, it's a thinker. Mm-hmm. So Thanks, well, Paddy. Well done Paddy. Paddy for that. Thanks for that, mate. Uh, so the score <laughs> the score was eight six to you, lads. It's now eight seven. So Paddy's also helped me claw that one back. Remember, if you think you know the answer to this week's Mystery Cell and want to win 30 days free of the Celtic Exchange Plus, then simply reply to our pinned tweet at Celtic Exchange using the hashtag Mystery Cell.